Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this Dane County Executive Candidate Forum, organized by the League of Women Voters of Dane County, the University of Wisconsin-Madison Center for Communication and Civic Renewal, and the Sequoia Branch of the Madison Public Library. I'm Joy Cardine. I'm with the League of Women Voters of Dane County, and I'll be one of your moderators tonight. I'll be the other one. My name is Mike Wagner. I'm a professor at UW-Madison, and I direct the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal. We are delighted to welcome four candidates, all four candidates for Dane County Executive tonight. We'll introduce them in the order that was determined by a very exciting drawing that took place moments ago. Um, we have Wes Sparkman, Regina Vitiver, Melissa Agard, and Dana Pelabon. This will be the order that our candidates will give their opening statements. Closing statements will be in reverse order. They will have three minutes for opening statements and two minutes to answer each question and for closing statements. We are going to rotate who answers each question first. We have timekeepers and they are watching the clock and we have asked the candidates to stop when they see the red stop sign. Cue the stop sign. <laughs> There we go. We okay. have also asked the candidates to not address other candidates in their answers or direct questions to the other candidates. And we ask the audience to also resist cheering or jeering when a candidate says something you like or even something you don't like. Joy and I have prepared some questions to get us started, uh, but we will get to as many of your questions as we can during the time that we have this evening. So please feel free to fill out the note cards you either have in your hand, or if you don't have one and want one, just raise your hand and a volunteer uh, from the League of Women Voters will bring one to you. If you're joining us via Zoom, you can type your question in the chat feature and uh, through the magic of human technology, we'll grab those questions as well and ask as many as we can. All right, let's get started. Opening statements first. And our first candidate's uh, opening statement will be Wes Sparkman. Thank you so much to the league and uh, thank you all for making time to be here this evening. In 1994, I began working as an intern for an amazing supervisor at the state of Wisconsin. She was smart, intuitive. She was an amazing leader and she was a person with a disability. As a mentor, she suggested that I serve on a board of directors. It was the Access to Independence Board. On the Access to Independence Board of Directors, I learned many fascinating community leaders, learned from them, and the experience helped to set my path of public service and community, community engagement. I went back to graduate school and earned my graduate degree, a Master of Public Affairs degree at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, La Follette School of Public Affairs. My focus on public personnel administration provided a great perspective on the many professional management and executive opportunities that would cross my path in the years to come. In 2023, I was awarded the La Follette School of Public Affairs Alumni of Distinction Award for my deeply rooted commitment to public service. As a police and fire commissioner for the city of Madison, past president of the Rotary Club of Madison and its foundation, past Community Development Block Grant Commissioner, where I learned about the cities, towns, and villages that surrounded the city of Madison. I honed my knowledge of the many levers that impact Dane County. When recruited to serve on boards, such as the University of Wisconsin Board of Visitors for the Sociology Department, the African American Ethnic Academy, the YMCA of Dane County, Madison Children's Museum, the United Way, law enforcement, leaders of color collaboration, the SSM Wisconsin Regional Board of Directors, the Dane County Climate Action Committee, the UW Madison's Chancellors, Leaders of Color Advisory Board, the Madison Metropolitan School Districts, Human Resources Advisory Council, and the Rotary Club of Madison Scholar Mentorship Committee. I was excited for the opportunity to serve this county that I love. Now, with the well-defined knowledge of the challenges that we face and a laser-focused interest in Dane County, I'm running to be your next Dane County executive. My vision for Dane County is to see a county where everyone has an opportunity to grow and thrive. As a Dane County department head, 
and director of the Tamara D. Grigsby Office for Equity and Inclusion after passing seven successful department budgets. I am very aware of the disparities that we face. Election time is approaching quick. On August 13th, oh yes, vote West for, for experience, fiscal prudence, and social responsibility. Thank you, Regina Vitiver. I also want to thank the organizers and for all of you for coming out. This is what democracy looks like, and I just really appreciate all of you being here. So I am Regina Vitiver, the scientist, public health professional, and experienced leader running to be your next Dane County Executive. Two days before my 15th birthday, my father died of pancreatic cancer. It was very advanced by the time they found it, and he was given only a month to live. But he was quite stubborn and actually lived for four months because he was determined to finish his final semester as a professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which is where I grew up. His passing made me want to be part of the cure. I aspired to become a cancer researcher. That's what brought me to UW-Madison to do my PhD in molecular biology. But with experience comes learning, and I learned that the lab was just not the place for me. Where I did find my passion was in science policy, both the ways that it's used and often ignored when making policy decisions. Now, I serve the state in the Division of Public Health, where I oversee chronic disease and cancer prevention programs, uh, plus for the last year, stretch assignment overseeing reproductive health and family planning and children and youth with special health care needs. I manage a budget of over $45 million and more than 60 people. I also serve on the Madison Common Council, where I put my collaborative leadership skills to the test for my community. Now, the most important thing for you to know about me is that there are two questions that drive me all day, every day. Who isn't thriving and what would it take for that to change? I don't pretend to have all the answers, but as a trained scientist and public health professional, I do know to look to the data for what works and to the community for how best to implement those approaches. With my extensive management and programmatic oversight background, I also know how to operationalize processes and get things done. On the Common Council, my leadership prioritizes coalition building by bringing diverse voices to the table. With this approach, I led efforts to create a zero interest loan program to increase access to childcare, champion initiatives to reduce our carbon footprint and finalize plans for the Madison public market. I also pushed for the expansion of the CARES team, which sends trained behavioral health specialists instead of police to appropriate calls. Now, Dane County is growing rapidly and facing significant challenges that require a collaborative, effective leader to work creatively with partners across Dane County to address our most pressing needs. With a data and results-driven approach, we can prioritize affordable and abundant housing, invest in mental health, and increase access to healthy, nutritious food, all while protecting our precious lakes and agricultural lands. As your next county executive, I pledge to bring my collaborative, effective, data-driven leadership skills to make sure Dane County is a place where everyone can thrive. Thank you, Melissa Agard. Good evening, I am Melissa Agard and I wanna thank the League and the Library and the University Center for Communication and Civic Engagement, did I get that correctly? Okay, uh, for hosting our event tonight and for all of you, in the room and who have joined us virtually. Um, we are at a pivotal moment here in Dane County and we do need a bold and effective leader in order to meet, move our community forward. Now, Dane County isn't just where I live. It's where I was born and where I'm raising my four amazing sons. And I understand the importance of county government, not just because I was a county board supervisor, a member of the state assembly and Senate and the Senate democratic leader, but because county government was there for me and my family when I was a kid. I grew up learning how to shop with food stamps back when they looked a bit like monopoly money stapled together. And I benefited from free lunches at school when I had to stand in a different line than the other kids and receive different food from what they were receiving. I experienced housing insecurity at times, and I know that because of a good, strong government, I was able to grow up knowing that my dreams matter. I was able to grow up and believe that I could run for the state legislature and be the minority leader in the state Senate and run to be a county executive. However, I, I do know that there are many things that we need to do better. 
I lost my youngest brother to fentanyl poisoning. And folks, I know that my family is not unique there. There are many people who have been impacted by wrongs, societal wrongs within our community, and we must address those issues. The county must care for the most vulnerable folks in our neighborhoods, and we also need to protect what makes our community so very special. By protecting our land and water, our agricultural heritage, investing in and supporting our businesses and our entrepreneurs, creating innovative workforce development solutions with the lens of fiscal responsibility. That's how we get it done. And I know we don't need to choose between these priorities. My track record as a leader is proven. It is unique. I've delivered real pragmatic results while being bold in unifying and unapologetic. I'm ready to lead Dane County into its next chapter to build on the leadership of County Executives Parisi and Falk, who I am very proud to have endorsing my candidacy. Dane County is an exceptional place. That is clear by the amount of people that are moving and staying here. And we have a high standard of what it is that we expect from our leaders. And I'm committed to protecting what matters most, as well as to provide that strong vision as we move forward. I know that we can thrive when we work together. Using the coalitions that we have built, I am excited to be running, to be your next county executive. And with your trust in your vote, I know that we can continue to build a county where everyone can thrive and prosper. Thank you. And Dana Pelabon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dana Pelabon, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the organizers, and thank you to the three people that I see more than my family at this point. <laughs> Um, so, you know, Dane County is my chosen family because I, I moved here as, as a late teen um, and decided to stay in this community. And the reason why I decided to stay in this community is because I have invested in the people in this community. Um, starting in my 20s, uh, when I was working in housing and noted that um, people were not getting into what we thought was affordable housing. And affordable housing wasn't affordable housing. So instead of waiting for things, um, and yes, I did go to many meetings, many, many committees, I said, we need something now. So I created a program that still runs today. It's called the Second Chance Program out of the YWCA. And it was effectively our very first um, Housing First program here in our county before Housing First even existed. And that was something that in my 20s I just said, I see a problem, I need to fix it. And I got a group of collaborators. I talked to property owners across the city um, and we got people housed because we looked for solutions um, within ourselves, within the community and within our partnerships. So over the years, um, I, what I became known for is access. So when I was a director of housing and, uh, and operations for Porchlight, um, one of the things that we noticed is that even at Porchlight, there were still barriers to get into housing. So instead of saying, well, this is what it is, um, we changed everything and how we do that housing to again, make housing the first priority for people who were unhoused. And so we removed barriers to let people have an easier access into the places and spaces that they needed to be. Um, through this, um, I was doing um, advocacy for mothers and myself and my son um, in the disability arena. My son who was diagnosed um, with a disability that was not covered by insurance. So me and moms got together and we said, that's not okay. And we stood at the Capitol for months and months and months until insurance made sure that my child was covered. And then my job, not my real job, but my job was to make sure that every other person around me was covered, which is what I do as the executive director of the Rape Crisis Center. Um, I make sure that services are accessible, um, and I do that with our county agencies now. Um, I've been doing that with our county agencies for the last 30 years. Um, in addition, um, I have been working in the arts um, arena. I have been on so many boards and so many committees. I could spend the next hour and a half going through them. But what's most important to know is that I have been here in the community doing the work of the community with the community by the community. Thank you all so much for those introductory remarks and introductions to your candidacies. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have 
questions you would like asked, you can write them on a note card and share them with one of our volunteers who will uh, bring them up to us so over the course of the evening. Uh, our first question will start with Regina Vitiver and work our way down the table and then come back to Wes Sparkman. Um, first question, what would be your approach to address the disparities that continue between black people and white people in Dane County when it comes to income, wealth, educational attainment, incarceration rates, and healthcare outcomes? That's a really difficult question. <laughs> Um, the honest truth is, is that, right, the system we have was designed to keep people who weren't part of the design of the system from benefiting from it. So we have to work hard to change the system. So I have been an outspoken advocate for housing at every level, both availability and affordability, increasing the affordable housing fund, looking at what we're doing with land banking refurbishing our existing home units that maybe need a little TLC, thinking outside the box and how we work with employers to develop housing. Everyone needs to have a safe and stable place to lay their head. And that is really fundamental. Um, educational systems are not meeting the needs of our children of color. Um, and at the county level, one of the things that we can do is to prioritize childcare access. On the Common Council, I spearheaded as zero interest uh, loan program to be able to increase access to childcare. And again, as a scientist, that is an experiment and it just started. So I don't know if I'm going to take it to county level yet because I don't know if it will work, but if it does, I will. Uh, we also need to talk about out of school time, violence prevention. And I also have been a huge proponent of the guaranteed income program. It has worked incredibly well in Madison and County Executive Parisi signed on to counties for a guaranteed income, and I promised to uphold his uh, sign on to that and actually implement it. Thank you very much. Same question, Melissa Agard. Thank you. So it is no secret that Dane County is um, way behind when it comes to addressing racial disparities. In fact, in my time in the state legislature, um, it was made very clear to us that we are the worst in the nation. And that is something that we should all be embarrassed about. Um, and uh, frankly, this is a bigger problem than right here in Dane County or right here in Wisconsin. We're experiencing these problems across our nation. Um, and it's gonna take an all hands on deck approach. We need to ensure that we're bringing diverse voices to the table and that we're having honest, hard conversations, being okay with being uncomfortable about what it means in order to move forward. Um, in the state legislature, I was the lead sponsor of the minimum wage bill in the state of Wisconsin, originally at $15 an hour. I know that is not enough. Um, that bill does have provisions to allow local governments to increase wages um, to make sure that there is dignity behind the work. We need to continue doing that. As the county executive, I will be spending time in the Capitol building advocating for bills like that. Child care counts. We know that we are um, in a real crisis when it comes to affordability and access to child care. Health care expansion in our communities as well. And increasing access to safe, affordable, appropriate housing. We have amazing examples, for example, in the redevelopment of the Bayview complex in downtown Madison, um, where the residents in the community came together and came up with a plan. And it is winning. People are looking at that and saying, yes, I want that in my backyard. Um, at the end of the day, we need human focused policies that invest in prevention instead of at the back end, paying attention to punitive actions. Um, and I am confident that with my relationships and my record that we're gonna be able to move this ball forward on the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Same question to Dana Palaba. So I'm gonna talk about what I've done to reduce disparities. Um, so in the criminal legal space, uh, I was one of 15 elected officials to study uh, racial discrimination and inequities in our carceral spaces. As a part of that work, um, what we did was bring reforms back here, um, including our community court, uh, which I spearheaded uh, with um, my co-chair. Um, as a part of the um, Racial Inequities Committee on the CJC, I was the co-lead of that. Um, what we did was focus to find out what spaces was, were still room for reform. And as a part of the, uh, the deal that I brokered to finally um, get the, the county jail funded, um, I put reforms into that deal. 
because that is what is going to be needed in order to move that space forward. You already heard a little bit about what I've done with housing. I mean, every space that I'm in, I reduce disparities because what I do is I make sure that the person who is most vulnerable, um, which tend to be black folks because we have the worst outcomes here, um, are the people that we are focused on to make sure that they are getting what it is that they need. Um, whether that be through education and training, um, which we have provided um, in the various organizations that um, I am on the board on or that I um, have run, um, whether that be through educational outcomes, sitting with parents, going through the IEPs, making sure that they understand the rights that their children have, um, making sure that when someone is coming through, um, all of our spaces, that there are no barriers. And if there are barriers, that instead of waiting for other people to make action happen, that we say, we're not gonna listen to this barrier. We're gonna push forward and we are going to make sure that the person that needs the help is getting the consolidated help that we need. Um, and that's the work that I've already done here in this county for 30 years. Thank you very much. Same question to Wes Sparkman. Yeah, so so there are many disparities uh, to name, as you mentioned, education, housing, economic development. Uh, I think uh, the answers lie in job development. And so uh, in my office at the Office for Equity and Inclusion, we did partnership with the Boys and Girls Club to have a collaboration for internships so students can get a chance to figure out what county jobs are all about. There are over 20 Dane County departments and fortunately, those young people, since we've had the Office for Equity and Inclusion, have had an opportunity to go and visit those departments and get to learn what those departments are about. So jobs, internships, economic development. So uh, part of what we do in the office as well is targeted business development, which means uh, women-owned business development, which uh, during the time that I've served as the director and nationally, uh, the number of women-owned businesses has increased exponentially, and that's the way it should be. Um, we need to focus on home ownership and home ownership for everyone and figure out, many of us know that that is uh, the way to uh, develop e for, the, to, for economic development and to move on. Um, we know that equity in our homes uh, can be used in many different ways, but it requires home ownership. And so that's something that we need to talk about, bring to the forefront. Um, I also had a chance in the past to serve on a fee elimination uh, committee where we actually did reduce thousands of dollars of fees just because we went one department at a time asking if they had unnecessary fees. So there's a lot of things that we can do and we need to just uh, keep working at it. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go right to um, the audience questions because we have a lot of them already. The uh, first question from the audience will be answered first by Melissa Acard. What specific steps would you propose to reduce the county's carbon footprint? Uh, that is a great question. Our public lands and waters, our natural spaces here in Dane County define our community. And it's a big reason why many people live here um, and work here. And preserving our environment is in Dane County isn't just for one person or another or for the government. It is an, an area where our government as well as our industry and our private sector need to roll up our sleeves and work with one another. Now, County Executive Falk um, was a national leader and an innovator in environmental protections here in Dane County. And we are very lucky that County Executive Parisi ended up following in her footsteps and making this a priority for him as well. Um, we are um, creating as much energy as we need here in Dane County on the, on the government side. And with the amount of growth that is gonna be happening in Dane County, we need to keep our foot on the gas, so to speak, or maybe on not the gas um, in order to make sure um, that we continue uh, with that with green and renewables. Um, but we do need to focus on um, decarbonization as well. And we can focus on decarbonization, not only in our county facilities, but also by using our 
um, office of climate change where we have um, great staff working every single day, not only in the best interest of Dane County, but to support our businesses and outside industry um, to be able to have access to the best practices. And um, whether that's working with our fleets, with our buildings, new buildings, and also retrofitting old buildings, it is clear that there are many things that we can do as individuals, as citizens of our community, as well as our government, um, in collaboration to ensure that Dane County is a national leader when it comes to continuing environmental protections. Thank you. Thank you. Dana Pelvon. So Dane County already is a national leader in a lot of these spaces, thanks to the work of prior county executives. Um, in addition, um, what, what we want to do is make sure that we are following our climate action plan. So this is a plan that has been put in place um, that is currently working. And so I don't want to deviate from a, a plan that is already in place and doing what it's supposed to do. Um, but there are spaces that we are not addressing, like environmental racism. Um, there is environmental racism that is happening on the northeast side of our county that we are not addressing adequately, that we are not pushing for remediation uh, for folks in their homes, um, that we are not pushing hard enough on uh, what is going on with our PFAS. And so my second part of what it is that we need to do for our county already um, behind our climate action plan is to address the environmental racism that is harming the citizens in our county. We cannot allow um, our successes to overshadow the spaces that we need to do work in. And we have here in this county allowed that to happen. So my second point of my environmental plan is to make sure that we aren't harming the people that live in our county. And that if there are spaces that are being harmed, that they get the mediation and the um, essentially the, the time and the money and the energy to make that right, um, because we haven't done that yet. And that is, that is the most important thing for me moving forward, because we are already doing so many things right in this space. Thank you, Wes Sparkman. Yeah, I agree that the county, Dane County, we all should, should be happy to know that it is a national leader. Uh, I had the, the benefit and privilege of serving on the Climate Action Planning Committee, and I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, the disparities and who's harmed the most from uh, emissions issues. Uh, and we all should, should be aware that residential gas emissions, uh, wood gas emissions cause challenges, and of course, car emissions also cause uh, challenges. So what we need, we really need to continue innovative solutions. We've, we've begun the action that it takes and uh, in, in many municipalities have not gotten started, uh, but it really is gonna take uh, collaboration with not just Dane County, but the surrounding counties as well and the surrounding states as well. So this is a discussion that's gonna be going on for a long time. Um, I, I, we should celebrate the fact that uh, County Executive Parisi did start the, and begin the Office of Climate Change, which again is taking the action to address the needs that we have in Dane County. Regina Vitiver. It's always really fun to be the last one because I just get to say ditto um, and then try to say, okay, here's the things that haven't been mentioned yet. So a few things. Um, uh, on Madison Common Council, I championed our building energy savings plan. So this is a program that um, takes commercial buildings, which were actually seen to uh, contribute about 30% of the carbon in our city uh, and say, you need to tighten up your actions here. And again, that's a new program. We got to see if it works. And if it works, it can serve as a model for our surrounding municipalities. We also really need regional approaches to transportation that work for a variety of areas. Madison Metro is not going to be able to serve the whole county, but we need approaches that allow people to have other options besides driving single occupancy vehicles, whether it's park and ride sites, shared van services. The village of Oregon is doing the, a transportation study funded mostly by the state. And I am so excited to see what they find out because they're asking their residents, what will you use? And again, when we have the results of that, that can also serve as a model for other areas. 
Our sustainability campus that's going to be our new landfill is a remarkable plan. There is going to be so much stuff that doesn't go into our landfill anymore as a result of the work that's going on there. And of course, we're gonna continue the biogas recapture. Um, we also, our county website is fantastic. It is one of the best websites about how to do, how to implement all of the things from uh, the Biden-Harris administration energy savings plan. We need to publicize that so everybody knows that that's a resource for them and that they can access those materials. And I just had somebody talking to me about something really exciting around uh, how we can change our concrete usage, because apparently that actually has a lot of carbon offsets. Uh, and so I really want to explore that and try to figure out what policies we might be able to set in place there. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question will begin uh, with Dana Pelabon and then come back uh, to the, uh, this end of the table and, and work our way down. Uh, also, uh, an excellent question from our audience. Dane County includes a wide variety of places. Why are you the candidate best suited to representing all of those places, including Madison, suburbs, and rural communities around Dane County? Well, um, so why am I the best candidate across the board is, again, my relationships in all of the spaces. Um, whether that be conversations that I have um, with the folks in Wanakee. I've also managed properties throughout all of these spaces. So these are all spaces that I've been in, I've worked in. Um, I remember when I built a, a, the very first jazz um, jazz concert in the park over in Mesa Maney, um, back in the, in the early 2000s. Um, so I have been in all of these spaces doing work here and there always undercover because um, I didn't have time to worry about, do I have the power? Do I have um, the publicity? Um, instead, I was thinking, what can we do in every space that I'm in? Um, and because I'm in every space and I am in every community, um, I live in Fitchburg, I do work in Fitchburg. Um, I am in the Sun Prairie, um, working with schools, uh, working out in the outskirts of our, of our county, making sure that we have accessible services, not just throughout our county, but throughout the state. That's what I do as the executive director of the Rape Crisis Center, ensuring that service provision happens for everyone, not just the people where it's easier to access the services. Um, instead, I have to, as a part of my job, worry about what is happening in every space. So when me and the people who are working on our violence prevention plan, and when we are working on uh, coalescing our purchase of service agencies, that is coalescing and making sure that all of the spaces have access. Access doesn't just stop in the city. Access includes every part of Dane County. Um, and so for me, um, I believe that I am the best. Actually, I take that back. I know I am the best. Not because I'm better than anybody up here, but because, again, I have been deeply embedded in these spaces doing work across our county and across our state for decades. Thank you very much, Wes Sparkman. Thank you. Yeah, there's been a, a really good amount of economic development in the city's towns and villages that surround Madison, Sun Prairie, Stoughton, Verona, Wanakee. We've seen the development take place. Uh, I think for me, uh, my experience uh, in, in visiting different Rotary clubs as a member of the Rotary uh, and, and learning about being a part of uh, those communities, I think that's made a difference for me in my experience. My experience as a police and fire commissioner, I mentioned, and in the conversation about emergency management and, and being ready for emergency management when that time comes, it does take the ability to communicate with the police chiefs, fire chiefs, and the individuals that are getting the work done. Um, as a community development block grant commissioner, also uh, allocating funds to the different uh, villages and towns around Dane County uh, really get an idea of what the needs are, the needs of uh, innovation, uh, the needs to sustain buildings that were built that you know, we all want to see uh, continue in their growth. Uh, those are all important pieces and experiences, I think, that, that really make me a unique candidate for this job. Thank you very much. Regina Vitiver. 
So first of all, in my day job with the State Division of Public Health, um, we take equity at its broadest terms. So health equity doesn't just mean around race and ethnicity. It also is around age. It's also around ability. It's also around uh, sexual orientation. It's also around the rural urban divide. So I'm incredibly cognizant in the work I do all day, every day, in how we meet the needs of people across the state, which is a reflection of the county as well. Our mantra is nothing about us without us. And so I pledge to make sure that I am listening, that I am engaged, and I'm collaborating because it's going to be each community that says, this is what we need. And it's not gonna look the same in every town, every village, or every city. It's going to be dependent on their specific needs. And so the most important thing to do is to listen and to be able to say, all right, let's figure out how we meet those solutions together. We also have plans for everything in our region, whether it's our climate action plan, our transportation plans, our housing plans, and these are all inclusive of all of these spaces. So understanding that those plans take into account the different needs of the different communities and that we need to meet them where they are is critically important. Um, some of those things that you know I've talked about already are expanding the CARES program throughout the county, which is not gonna look the same as it does in Madison, expanding transportation options throughout the county, and making sure that we also are recognizing the role of tourism in our community because the county gets a sales tax. And so tourism really helps us reduce property taxes and people want to come here because they want to see the difference between the urban and the rural spaces so close together. It's a, it's a highlight. So these are some of the things that we can do. Thank you very much. And Melissa Agard, same question to you. Thank you. So we've talked about this a little bit. Dane County is pretty amazing. We have such diverse um, places to live, work, and play in our community, and it is really what defines us and makes us so very special. Um, having served in the state legislature, um, probably the most challenging state legislature in the neighbor or in the country, um, and being elected unanimously by my colleagues to be the Democratic leader, the voice for Democrats all across uh, the state of Wisconsin. I've had to walk into rooms and be able to work with folks like Robin Voss and Devin Lemmehu. And I've also had to go back into my district and be unapologetic about what it is that my friends and neighbors need. Um, I know it's a matter of showing up, it's a matter of earning trust, um, and it's a matter of being able to deliver. Um, being able to earnestly hear what it is that matters to people and to roll up your sleeves and figure out the solutions. Um, and that is why mayors from across Dane County have endorsed my candidacy because I have been there for them. Whether I represented them or not, I have been there for them. That is why the business community believes that I will be able to continue to bring innovation and dollars into our community. Um, Government is complicated, but ultimately it is the role of the county executive to be a convener, to bring the different people together um, to address and make sure that our county is working for everyone, from our main streets, to our human services, to our environment. And I have the track record and um, the experience to be able to move Dane County forward in the best interest of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to combine a couple of audience questions into one. So excuse me for that. Someone wants to know, uh, if elected, what would you do to make sure the crisis triage center opens and provides service to Dane County residents who are in a mental health or substance abuse crisis? And someone wants to know, in a related uh, question, how would you decrease incarceration of people in a health crisis? And we start with Wes Sparkman. Thank you. Yeah, the, we have, uh, we do have uh, some concerns that we want to get in front of. The, uh, the a, a big question is what type of uh, clinic-based services we already have, what type of emergency services we already have, and what, what type of community-based mental health services we have right now. Getting a better understanding of that, I think is gonna help us uh, move in the right direction in the future. Um, 
uh, right now for Dane County Journey, mental health is one of the largest uh, mental health uh, uh, or one of the largest purchase of service contracts that we have in, uh, in providing all of those services, clinic based. So uh, receiving services when they, within the clinic and emergency services as well. Um, and for the question about, uh, about the jail and, uh, and, and reducing the numbers there, Dane County figured it out during the pandemic. They figured, we figured it out really quick. So uh, there were some methods used. Uh, it's something that the uh, Criminal Justice Council and Subcommittee on Race also uh, observed. But I think it's gonna take us to continue to use the same type of innovation, innovative strategies we had to use during the pandemic and think about planning ahead and deciding as a community what types of methods we wanna use uh, that we've already used before to reduce that population. Regina Vitiver. So first of all, the Crisis Triage Center is a huge priority. We have to get it done. And as someone who works in the Department of Health Services right now, I have relationships that already exist in that agency that I will draw on to make sure that we are crossing every T and dotting every I so that we are fully able to implement what we need in our community as soon as possible. It will be a very high priority for me. Um, I also want to talk about how we reduce the incarceration. So again, I've been a champion of the CARES program that has been incredibly successful. So in about three years and almost 5,000 calls, there's only a 2% conversion rate to police. That's a really great statistic that we should all really say yay about. And we can do that for the whole county. It's not going to look the same as it looks in Madison. It's, we have different uh, emergency response agencies in different parts of the county, and many of them are volunteer run. So it's not going to look the same as it looks in Madison. That's okay. We need to figure out how to get it done so that we're meeting the needs of everyone where they're at. I also want to talk about something else that I've done on Common Council, which is um, that we have currently, because we don't have a crisis center, we are taking folks to Winnebago Mental Health Center when they need it. And for a very long time, it was our police officers who were doing that transport, which A, is not good for taking our police off the streets, but B, is also not good for the people who are in crisis. They police officers aren't who they should be with at that time. And so I was at the forefront of making sure that we could find an alternate transport service and that the both the Madison Police Department is using and the Sheriff's Office is using as well, because both recognize the importance of making sure that when people are in crisis, they're served by the right people. And that's usually not law enforcement. Thanks. Melissa Agard. So behavioral health, addiction are pervasive and real problems in our community. And both of them come with an awful lot of stigma. And we need to work really hard to remove stigma so that we can make safe places for folks to be able to raise their hand and ask for help. But then when they do raise their hand and ask for help, shame on us that right now there's a six month waiting period before someone can actually get their help. Um, shame on us for the fact that someone who is in the middle of a behavioral health crisis ends up in our jails. That's not where they're gonna get the support that they need. Um, Again, I shared a little earlier about the loss of my little brother um, to the opioid crisis. He died from fentanyl poisoning during the COVID pandemic. And he was able to spend more time in jail than he was in behavioral health and addiction treatment programs. And that's right here in Dane County where many people say that our human services are top notch. A crisis triage center is necessary in Dane County in this region. Um, based on our population, based on growth, um, and really it's the morally right thing to do. Um, so citing a crisis triage center here in Dane County is vitally important, keeping people out of jail, making sure that people are getting the support that they need. Um, it needs to happen. Um, and we have an awful lot of dollars that are gonna be coming into Dane County um, because of the opioid crisis. Um, settlement dollars. Those are dollars that are coming here because people have died. We need to be stewards of those dollars and make sure that we are investing them wi wisely in our community so that we are meeting people in the needs that they have right now. And certainly decreasing incarceration is vitally important. We need to work on bail reforms. We need to prioritize electronic monitoring, community service, invest more in mental health, and again, make sure that diverse voices are at the table. Thank you. 
and Dana Pelabon. So we already have everything that is needed in place to put in the crisis triage center, um, except for the laws in the state of Wisconsin that prevent us from doing so and making it a 24 hour center. So there's zero things that anybody at this table um, can do as county executive to make that happen. Um, that has to come from the legislature so that um, the work that we did on the county board, um, including the work with uh, the Public Protection and Judiciary Committee that I was on and the Health and Human Needs Committee to make sure that that could be in place um, is ready to go. Um, we need the laws to change to make that happen. Um, so here is what we are doing currently to keep people out of jail. Um, what we are doing is we are increasing the restorative justice work um, that is being done in our county. We currently have a restorative justice court. We currently have a drug court. Um, we are looking and have been looking at where are there spaces to increase um, uh, increase people's access to those courts. Um, in addition, the community court allows for a higher level of offense to be roped into our restorative justice courts. Um, in addition, I am working with um, our health and human services department, and I am on the leadership team of our purchase of serv service agencies to coalesce all 400 plus points of service agencies here in our county. Because we have duplications of services, um, we need to make sure um, that everyone knows where their space is, what is county space, what is POS space, and what is community space. Um, and that is work that we are currently doing to make sure that we are able to meet the needs of those who are have mental health crises here. Um, and as far as expanding cares, we did put money towards that. Um, and what we are finding in our rural areas is that it is not possible in the way that the model looks now. Um, so we have been talking with um, a variety of different people across the county to um, look at models to make that more feasible in our rural areas. Thank you very much. Uh, for this next question, we'll start with Regina Vitiver. And I will steal a page from Joy's playbook and combine two questions that are similar thematically, though they have a different specific area of focus. Our audience members write, uh, one writes, you can tell a lot about a person by the way they treat our most vulnerable and important workers, including cashiers, servers, childcare workers, teachers, and the like. How would our most vulnerable workers in Dane County describe their experiences with you? That's question part one. Part two is how can your position uh, as Dane County Executive, make uh, the Dane County uh, prison and police become more caring of all of our citizens, especially those who are the most vulnerable from either economic or racialized uh, uh, experiences? That is a fascinating question or fascinating series of questions and new. We haven't gotten that question before in all of the um, forums that we've done so far. So good job. <laughs> um, I sure hope that people would say that um, that I'm polite and pleasant and, um, you know, I'm trying to think about just the other night uh, where a friend and I got together for drinks and it was closing. And, you know, I said to the server, I said, do you need us to get out of here? And she's like, as long as you pay the bill, you know, you're sitting outside, you can stay. Okay. And then they did turn the lights out on us and, and then we left. But, but you know, I was made sure that, that the server understood that I knew what her needs were too. So um, I sure hope that that comes across in, in the way that I work. Um, uh, in terms of our prisons and police. So one of the things that I have found is that our, in our Madison police force and I believe our sheriff's force as well, are frankly some of the best law enforcement agents in the nation. We probably have the highest level of social workers in our law enforcement than anywhere. And they are really caring. Um, you know, I had a situation in my own neighborhood and the officers that came, you know, they were very professional and they were very straightforward with the person who was having the situation. And they said, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And we want to make sure that you know what that outcome is going to be because that's going to impact your family. And I found them to be so incredibly professional, so caring. And that's been my experience. And I can't speak to other people's experiences because I haven't been there. So if there is an experience where you're not experiencing a caring professional in one of our law enforcement, 
we need you to report it because that's something that has to be worked on um, from a systemic level. Thank you very much. Same questions to Melissa Agard. Again, looking at, I have a similar reaction to Regina, looking at how other people see you, it's important to think about that every day and how it is that we walk through life and, and take space. And, you know, whether we're talking about um, vulnerable workers in our communities or our children, um, we absolutely need to have a lot of compassion. We have to believe in the good. One of the um, fundamental frames that I use in my office with my interns and my staff and um, when I was leader in the Capitol building is really believe in best intentions. Um, your first reaction, um, your first impression on people is really going to, that's going to plant the seeds. And um, I work very hard um, to travel through life, believing in the best and, and lifting um, folks up um, in the rooms that I go in. Um, Life is complicated, and I am sure there have been times where um, people have been rubbed the wrong way. Um, heck, my kids don't agree with me all of the time, right? Um, but I tend to think that um, I love them um, deeply and that they love me deeply. Uh, so uh, really, it, it, it's a matter of how it is that you frame um, your life and, and how, you, how it is that you walk through it. Um, when it comes to our judicial system, um, it is vitally important that caring is centered in the work that they do. And whether it is providing mental health first aid training um, for our workers, investing in more social workers, um, training our 911 operators to be able to divert people from the police departments into mental health support, um, certainly there are many things that we can be doing. Um, in order to provide that softness and that compassion through the justice system. But I would hope that that would be carried through with our zoning department and human services and parks um, as well. Ultimately, government is about service um, and um, knowing that we all in our community need to care for one another in order for our community to grow and move forward. Thank you very much. Same questions to Dana Pelaba. Um, so the 200 plus people that came to my service industry party uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, they love me um, because I, uh, as the co-owner of The Frequency, uh, which was a music venue uh, that was in downtown Madison for 10 years, um, worked really hard with them to create a safe night nightlife space and a sustainable workplace for them and people in the community. And I did that with partners throughout um, the service industry, whether that be with Lily Lux, um, with other owners that were on the street and in the neighborhood, whether that be in city committees, um, that's the work that I've been doing already. So um, I, I used to be a service industry person. I know what it's like. I know what it's like um, to be at the end of your day and somebody yelling at you. And how is it that you can be self-sustaining through those spaces? Um, so again, I create systems for sustainability for people who are most vulnerable. Um, and that's what I have done in the service industry. Um, and for law enforcement, I train every single law enforcement that comes into this county, every single one because they have to go through our programs here. And a part of that training is about um, being trauma-informed, trauma-responsive, understanding intersections of oppression, understanding how um, to deal with someone who is in trauma, understanding their trauma because they have secondary traumatization. So there are um, a lot of spaces where I am with law enforcement. And when things go wrong, as the executive director of the Rape Crisis Center, I go and talk to them. And I say, this isn't okay, or this was great. But we keep the lines of communication open um, because in order for us to dismantle systems, we have to have communication. And I have communicated with law enforcement for 30 years through housing, through victim services, through training, um, through unconscious bias work, um, through um, dismantling the intersections of oppression that are in that space, and supporting law enforcement, um, even the LGBTQ folks um, who don't feel supported in those spaces, those are the spaces that, that I reside in. 
Thank you very much. And same questions to Wes Sparkman. Yeah, well, I, I have to mention that, that not everyone gets straightforward care from the police. We're seeing right now, uh, uh, right now in the news, we see we saw a, a shooting that took place uh, again and a killing that took place by the by police officers. Uh, it's something that we're going to have to constantly look at and review. Uh, when I was a police and fire commissioner, one of the things that I constantly talked to the police and fire about and, and a concept that I raised is that love is the greatest protector. I want to be protected in love, even on my worst, even if it's my worst day. So do you all. And that's the, really, that's the police, that's the job of a police, a good police officer, a good p community police officer. So, uh, so for me, I believe in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I, and I, I think that that's what we all should consider in how we uh, go about the things that we do. Thank you. Next question goes first to Melissa Agard. And I'm having so much fun combining questions. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> they're, they're related and we want to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, we have an audience member who says county highways are among the most dangerous for bicyclists and pedestrians because of higher speeds and wider lanes. How will you work to reduce traffic violence? And another says many communities outside of Madison are taking on the issue of ATV and UTV use on local roads. This increases air and noise pollution and impairs road safety. Do you think uh, such use should be decided municipality by municipality? Good questions. So here in Wisconsin, um, since the legacy of Governor Walker continues to be pervasive in our communities, um, multimodal transportation um, and um, regional transit opportunities uh, are not something that we have access to in the way that we should. Um, we need to think about how it is that we're gonna get people around within our communities if we wanna be serious about protecting our environment um, and frankly meeting the needs of our kids in our growing communities. Building more roads is not the most sustainable answer there. Um, having opportunities for bikes and pedestrians to be able to navigate across Dane County is vitally important. Folks, I live on the north side of Madison. There are not safe ways to ride your bike from the north side of Madison uh, to downtown. Even for my kids to be able to get, east, to, e get to East High School, it's, it's not safe. There are, there are not um, adequate paths. Um, so this is something that isn't just uh, the rural parts of Dane County, but it's in fact all of Dane County. And that's why I introduced legislation for complete streets here in the state of Wisconsin. And I will continue to advocate for that in the state Capitol building. It is vitally important that our departments of um, transportation um, can think about complete streets when, when they're moving forward. Um, and when it comes to ATVs and UTVs, it is striking to me when I go to counties um, across the state of Wisconsin, and they are driving on the highways next to other cars with children in them. Um, we do need to have safety protections and, and guidelines for folks, um, including our alcohol consumption when it comes to ATVs and UTVs. But I also believe very much in local control. And I think there is a way to thread that needle to ensure safety on our roads, um, as well as um, to allow our local governments to make decisions that are best for them. Dana Pelabon. All right, y'all. So my husband got me an electric bike uh, two years ago. And so for the very first time, I've been out on our roads and the bikes. Um, and the city of Fitchburg actually is one of the models um, that I look to for what it is that has been done on the roads to make it safer. Uh, so there are traffic calming devices uh, that have been put onto the roads. Um, that is still being built up, making sure that there is enough space um, for bikes and, and knowing that there are um, interconnected pathways. So we in Fitchburg, which is where I live, um, have a really great space and great model on how to expand um, what that looks like on our roadways. Um, 
And then as far as ATVs, you know, what happens in a rural space and on rural roads is intrinsically going to be different than what happens on our highways, right? And so for someone that doesn't live in that community to impose what it is that we think about what should be happening into that community without having conversations with that community and having buy-in from everyone in that community um, is, is foolhardy. So we need to make sure that we are in, in including the folks um, that this actually affects instead of those of us um, who don't. I mean, I don't ride an ATV, um, but I have friends that do. I have constituents that do, um, and I'm not going to tell them to do something based on my experience. Instead, we're going to look at what it is that is needed in that community and the rules that are needed in that community and have the community decide what that looks like for them. Thank you. Wes Sparkman. Yeah, I think this, this area is really a conversation with the experts. Uh, the highway department is under, Dane County Highway is under new leadership, and I think very good uh, leadership. But as county executive, in collaboration with the highway department and listening to the, airport, the uh, experts on the best methods to, uh, to get around, I, I really do believe we have an opportunity to uh, create safe travel routes over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, but just like most things, we have to plan ahead and we have to listen to uh, the people who've been studying this for a long time. Um, as far as the ATVs are concerned, uh, yes, I do th believe that local control is the way to go. Uh, and for Dane County, because of the combination of the urban rural mix, I think that's something that uh, uh, we want to maintain local control over the, uh, the guidance of that. Thank you, Regina Vitiver. So this is a place where I get to say ditto again. Um, so as Senator Agard mentioned, she's worked at on Complete Green Streets at the state level. I have also worked on that at the city level. We do have now a Complete Green Streets policy in the city of Madison. Um, and that, again, is an opportunity to serve as a model for our other municipalities um, and work collaboratively with our towns to see what might make sense for them. It, Again, what we're doing in urban areas is not going to be the same solution that we need in rural areas. Um, we absolutely need to be listening to community concerns. And I'm going to give an, give an example. So um, on Mineral Point Road, right up here, uh, there was a proposal to um, uh, put it on a road diet. Um, and it was because that the road was due for resurfacing. And so this was something that could be done within the scope of the resurfacing project. And I said, okay, wait, we, let's get some community input. And what we heard, and literally this is this neighborhood, um, is that they needed two things, safe ways to cross the road and slower speeds. And so my question to the transportation department is, is a road diet going to meet those needs? If it is, great, that's a good solution. But if that's not the best solution for the problems that the community has identified, Let's not just do it because we can. Let's figure out what the right solution is to meet the needs of the community. And so I'll say the same thing for ATV and UTVs. Uh, we need to make sure that it's safety first and whether that's doing education around alcohol consumption or where they should be traveling to make sure that people are safe at all times. That is our number one concern. And again, that should be at the local level. Thank you very much. Uh, getting closer to the end of our time. So I'm going to combine three questions, but I promise it's not really three questions. It's really two in a couple of uh, interesting ways. So, so first, what are the main, uh, and we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Dana Pelabon on this one. What are the main areas of county executive responsibility and what areas aren't? And thinking about that, we'll move to part two, which is how would you approach collaborating with other local government entities from cities and towns within Dane County to neighboring counties to deal with regionalism and shared services? Well, um, so things that the, that the county executive does. County executive um, determines budget with the, with the departments. Um, county executive manages agencies and ensures that the programs are functioning in the way that they need to be functioning. Um, it manages um, the department heads. Um, it also, uh, the, the county executive also um, determines strategic priorities for the county. 
um, across all of the different agencies. Um, there is hiring and firing that happens um, from the county executive. Um, the county executive is an executive position. Now, there is some interaction with legislatures, right? So there is some lobbying, but a lot of that actually is done by our lobbyists because we should be busy with running the county. Um, and allow our lobbyists to do the work that they were paid to do to make sure that our interests are put forward. Um, in addition, um, with our county and how it is that we we interact with the with the towns again these are relationships that a lot of us have built i have built relationships with people across our county in different municipalities um, in different spaces in those municipalities so again continuing to have conversations continuing to to work with folks um, having the hard conversations and the easy conversations um, with everybody that we can in those spaces um, so yeah, those are the things I would do. Thank you very much. Same question to Wes Sparkman. All right, and thank you. Yeah, I had the the, uh, the opportunity to work for 11 years in uh, County Exec Kathleen Falk's office, and then leading into five years with uh, County Executive Parisi before Executive Parisi appointed me to my own department. So I spent some time in the County Executive's office. Uh, you know, I would really say one of the uh, primary uh, goals is the, is the county budget and managing the county budget is a huge concern. Uh, Human Services Department is, is the largest piece of the county budget and concerning us, in, and as a county exec, thinking about uh, human services, dividing into adult community services, economic and work services, and uh, uh, workforce development and so forth, uh, economic assistance and work services. So, uh, so all of those areas are important, and the county exec has to lead the way on that. I'm going to add collaboration with the county board is also a job of the county executive. Uh, and people don't realize it's actually a nonpartisan position. So it should not be a partisan discussions going on. It's a nonpartisan position. And the county exec should be able to work and develop public private partnerships uh, in the cities, towns and villages that surround Dane County and, and be able to create economic uh, development and opportunities there by collaboration. Um, the, the county exec is the head public personnel administrator. So being aware of what's going on, uh, working with the union and collaborating with uh, the unions of the county, uh, listening to the union and the union concerns, which is an expression of what's going on within the departments. I think that's part of the job of the county executive. Uh, and of course, I cannot uh, forget, uh, though, yes, I do serve as director of equity and inclusion, which includes civil rights. Really, the county exec is the chief equity officer. And the, the county executive has to have equity in mind in all of the decisions that the county executive makes. Thank you very much. Same questions to Regina Vitiver. So again, what they said. Um, so I'll just be additive. Um, so there are several positions uh, within the county that are independently elected, including the clerk, the sheriff, the treasurer, the district attorney. And so the county executive has to work alongside those independently elected folks to make sure that, as we said, the county executive is really setting the budget, obviously with the finance department, um, but working collaboratively with those separate electeds. Um, and since we're at a League of Women Voters event, I do want to talk a little bit about our clerk, um, because as we've seen, voting is under attack in this country. And so we need to make sure that the budget for our clerk's office, especially as we grow, is supported in a meaningful way to whatever we need to make sure that people have the opportunity to vote. Um, we, at the moment, the county does not have a capital improvement plan that needs to change. As a member of the Madison Common Council and the Finance Committee, I was shocked when I learned that there wasn't a capital improvement plan at the county level. Um, that needs to be there so that we can plan out what capital projects are going to be done over time. Um, and that's critically important. And we have, we've talked about this already this evening, there are multiple types of plans in place, whether it's from CARP-C, MPO, um, even working with the um, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Sewerage District, which is an independent body, but that performs a critically important service for our residents Right? We have to be conscious of all the work that they're doing. So being in partnership with all of the entities that are functioning and, and 
understanding that we need to be collaborative across all these spaces is paramount. Thank you very much. And same questions to Melissa Agard. Thank you. So the county executive is responsible for leading county and county staff, roughly 3,000 folks that work for the county. There's the internal leadership there. Amazing people doing amazing work every single day. Um, it is like a, um, a freight ship. It's not going to be like a sailboat that is tacking. Um, meeting with those folks, what is working, what isn't working? How do we address challenges that are being faced? What sort of innovation can we invest in to move our county forward? And there's the external leadership of the county executive as well, working with our partners, whether they're the purchase of service agencies that are lifting up and providing adequate services for vulnerable people in our communities, whether it's MADREP, which is regional investing into our economy and the business world, CARPSI, thinking about our land and water use, um, tourism, so that we can capture as many of those tax dollars to reinvest in our communities, um, relationships with the uh, local levels of government, whether they're the mayors or the cities of the cities or the, the towns um, and the villages um, and the people that live there. Um, but ultimately, it is the job of the county executive to deliver on mandates that are brought to us by the federal and the state government. Many of those mandates come with dollars. But we do have some mandates that are delivered to us that are unfunded, and we need to figure out how it is that we're going to pay for those um, during challenging budgetary times. Um, ultimately, we need to take care of vulnerable folks in our communities, and we need to protect and preserve what is best about our communities at the same time. Success for me as a county executive will mean lifting up the voices and the values of the people that live, work, and play here in Dane County and addressing generational challenges that have sat on the table for far too long. Thank you. All right, thank you. So this might be our last question, depending on how long our candidates take. Um, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a question that my League of Women Voters colleagues uh, wanted, uh, wanted me to ask. Along with the race for Dane County Executive on the August ballot, there will be two constitutional amendment questions mm -hmm. dealing with um, federal funds and who should have the power to distribute federal funds. Essentially, if approved, this, these constitutional amendments would give that power to the legislature and take it away from the governor. What do you think of that idea? And how would it affect Dane County and West Sparkman, your first? Yeah, uh, no, I, I don't believe they should take that power away from the governor. And I, I do believe uh, in, in local control as, as we discussed earlier. Uh, so the answer is no to both of those questions. First of all, my suggested answer. Uh, and I think that uh, there's a lot we can learn about the possibilities in the relationship between uh, uh, the, uh, the state and the county and, uh, and what might be down the road in, in other areas that we need to really keep an eye on. So to the League of Women Voters, this type of civic ev event and engagement is so important. I'm very glad to see this crowded room here tonight. Regina. So as someone who uh, worked at the State Division of Public Health during COVID, I can tell you it was critical that the money that was coming in from the feds, we were able to get out quickly and to the communities for what they needed when they needed it. This, um, those, these amendments would have seriously inhibited that process. They should not be voted for. They should be voted down 100%. This is uh, an issue where, again, we have so many things at the state level where we are preempted, where, you know, we talk about being a home rule state, and yet we have a legislature that anytime they don't like something that one of our local municipalities wants to do, they put a kibosh on it. So we can't do inclusionary zoning, even though we want to, because we have, we are preempted from state legislature. We can't ban plastic bags because we are preempted from the state legislature. So this is a serious issue and it does affect us, right? It affects what we are able to do in our local municipalities. And so efforts like these to undermine the will of the people who voted for the governor that we have. Um, and I would say this no matter who is in power, because again, when we're looking at emergency services and emergency times, 
those decisions need to be made quickly. And the going back and forth between the governor's office and the legislature would just be untenable. Melissa Agar. So I'm a hard no on both of these constitutional amendments, and I've been battling the reality of them in the Capitol building um, since their inception. Uh, We in the state of Wisconsin have had one of the most vindictive, maniacal, Republican-led legislatures in the history of the United States of America. And the reason why these two questions are on our ballot here in Wisconsin in on this election is because my Republican colleagues weren't able to get these bills passed through traditional legislative action because they knew Governor Evers would veto them. Leaving these um, decisions up to the legislature would be malfeasance for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, We have, as a legislature, for example, voted to provide dollars to address homelessness in the state of Wisconsin. The Joint Finance Committee and the Republicans really refused to release that money. We in the legislature, bipartisanly, have voted to put money to address PFAS contamination across the state of Wisconsin, literally chemicals that are polluting and killing our friends and families right here in Madison and across um, across the state. The Republicans refuse to receive, re- release those dollars. Um, there are so many examples of how it is that putting those dollars in the hands of the legislature would be damaging to the state of Wisconsin. We absolutely need to stand up and educate our friends and neighbors on the importance of local control. And also when we are in the middle of a global health emergency, we need our chief executive officers to be able to make the best decisions for our own public health and safety so that we can navigate our way through this at the end of the day. We're all here because of Governor Evers' thoughtful, compassionate, and science-based leadership. So I am grateful for every time we have the opportunity to talk about the harm that will be done to the state of Wisconsin um, because of those referendum questions. And Dana Pelabon. Um, So the easy answer is no. Of course we don't support that because we do know the the importance of local control and and we know the importance of being able to act um, when something is needed. And um, while this didn't happen in the state of Wisconsin, uh, my family is from New Orleans. And when Hurricane Katrina came, um, one of the things that was real important for me when my grandfather was languishing in a nursing home um, with nobody to help, I kept calling the governor's office. And I said, we need to have somebody go there. We need to have somebody go there. We need to have somebody go there. And then um, they were able to bring the National Guard in specifically to, to rescue the folks that were in our nursing homes. So I know the importance of being able to have a governor um, that can move forward quickly in emergency spaces. Um, We see that here in Wisconsin with our natural disasters. I think back to um, the multiple tornadoes that have happened through our state, um, the flooding that has happened um, in our communities here. Um, And without the governor being able to to say this is where this money should go, um, then you know people don't get help, and people when they are in those spaces need help right now. Um, so this is a that's a, thank you, League of Women Voters, for giving us the answer that was the easiest answer we've had tonight. Given where we are in time, Joy and I have been passing notes. We think we can ask you a lightning round question. Of, we'll give you thirty <laughs> seconds. Um, and we'll start with Regina Vitiver and move down the, the table. And that question is, as Dane County Executive, what would be the thing that you would be most likely to cut in the Dane County budget? It's a really hard question because I've mostly thought about what I would add. Um, so I think I'll answer this with uh, not a specific thing, um, but just to think about looking for those places where there is efficiency um, opportunities. So um, I'm certified in results-based accountability. And what that means is, is that you look at a result you want to achieve, you identify the indicators that'll tell us if you get there, um, and then you identify the strategies that will get you there, and then wind up um, developing those things. And I think if we go through that process with more of our work, we will gain efficiency. Same question to Melissa Agar. 
So by the time this election is over, the most current budget will be over. And um, we are going to be having a pretty, by my understanding, a pretty baseline budget from the last session. I do think that it would be um, disingenuous for a county executive candidate to say, I'm going to cut this one service without having the opportunity to talk to the leaders of the different departments, the agencies um, that are providing the services across the county. I think we need to think about where there is duplication of services, where there is the ability to take silos down um, and bring people together. Frankly, over the years, we've asked our service agencies to tighten their belts. I think it's time for the county to think about where it is that they can um, tighten, tighten our own belts as well. Same question to Dana Pelaba. Uh, so we're already doing that work um, with coalescing what is happening with our purchase of service agencies so that we can make sure that we are being efficient. Um, so that is work that's currently being done. And then in addition, I am going to add something because I have been talking to our county heads um, for the last two years on the county board, um, and that is our vacant positions. Um, we've had some positions that have been embedded in our budget for a really long time, um, and that is a space that is a... Um, a hard space to cut, um, but an easy space to, to move through because we aren't affecting um, jobs currently as they sit um, with the knowledge that we can add things back in the future as we need. Thank you very much. And Wes Barkman. Yep. Yeah. It, uh, good uh, financial prudence means that there will always be some types of cuts going on. Um, I wouldn't shock the count the uh, department heads though at the uh, end of December and say, "Hey, we're going to cut everything." I would not do that. Uh, but um, uh, we we had a fee reduction committee during COVID, and it actually produced savings of thousands of dollars just because we asked uh, uh, the department heads, "Where are there areas where you have excessive fees?" So that's something I would reconsider, and also. Um, uh, uh, again, reducing the redundancy that kind of built up over COVID and checking budgets for things that were not expended during that, those, that time is another way I would handle that. All right. Thank you. It's time for closing statements, and we will do the reverse order of opening statements, meaning we will start with Dana Pelabon. So thank you all um, for listening to us uh, go through what our plans are. Um, and the thing that I want to leave you with um, is this is a space that I am running for um, because what I want to do is impact our county residents on a greater level on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I already have been impacting our county residents for the last 30 years because I am in the communities doing the work. I am working with the agencies to hone the work that they are doing. I am consulting. Um, I am listening. I am having conversations that are hard. And then I am working with folks to come up with solutions and then implementing those solutions and making sure that they are uh, financially viable and sustainable and equitable. Um, and that there is access for everyone in that space. Because regardless of what our plans are, unless we are caring for the folks that are most impacted in our community, and unless we are the ones that they know to come to, Right? So there are people that do not come to our spaces because they don't necessarily feel safe. It's why people like me end up being the solutions for a lot of communities. It's because we need to increase the impact that we have in our spaces um, across our county. Um, and I am running for county executive not to do anything else, not to do anything else moving forward. This is where I want to be um, because this is the work that I have been doing in our community for 30 years. And this is the work that I want to continue um, until I am not dead, retired. Oh my gosh, I was going to say until I'm no longer here, but until I retire at the great age of 89. Um, so this is, this is the space that I want to be because I care about this community because this is a community um, that I have chosen um, for my family. Melissa Agard. Thank you so much uh, to the hosts and the moderators for tonight's forum and to my fellow candidates. Uh, being uh, someone who puts their name on the ballot is not for the faint of heart, certainly. 
Um, and I want to thank each of you um, for being here and for caring about our democracy. Because democracy isn't something that just happens all by itself. It's something that happens when we roll up our sleeves and we become part of it. It's a verb. Um, my name is Melissa Agard, and I am thrilled to be a candidate for Dane County Executive. I know that here in Dane County, we need a proven leader who is a collaborator and who's unapologetic about getting things done for the people of their community. And it's clear to me from the countless conversations that I've had with folks all across Dane County that there is a real desire for us to come together to the table to solve generational problems, as well as continue to move our community forward. By protecting our democracy, by investing in our workforce, by taking care of the most vulnerable folks who call Dane County home, as well as protecting and preserving the best parts of our heritage, we're gonna to continue to lead the way nationally. I'm honored to have the support and endorsements of folks at all levels of government, including Joe Parisi and Kathleen Falk, a broad coalition of current and former mayors representing every city in Dane County, statewide elected officials, legislators, local elected officials, and most importantly, my four amazing sons. And I hope to be able to add your support to that list. These folks are supporting me because they know that I am a leader with a proven track record who is committed to continuing to show up and listen and be engaged and roll up my sleeves on day one. So I ask for your trust in your vote as I embark on my next chapter in service to Dane County as the county executive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regina Vitiver. I really wish that I could spend more time with each of you because this is a really artificial situation where we have to answer really big questions in a very short amount of time. And most of these issues are quite complex um, and really aren't served uh, by kind of our, our trite answers. But um, so I hope that you'll take the time to seek us out um, and learn more about us. Because the honest truth is, is that every single person sitting at this table cares. And that's what, and including myself, that's why we're here. None of us is a California businessman trying to buy a seat. <laughs> so what I wanna leave you with is that the knowledge that the position of Dane County Executive is an executive management position. And I bring that experience in spades. With 25 departments to oversee, you need someone with a management experience to be able to oversee people, programs, and budgets, while ensuring that your tax dollars are spent on the priorities that make all of our lives better. And I'm the only candidate with the executive management experience who has worked at the federal and state levels at UW-Madison in nonprofit and is an elected official at the municipal level. In short, I've been inside every type of organization the county interacts with. This means I understand what it takes for each of our partnering entities to be successful at working alongside the county to meet our shared needs. You also need someone who puts your health and your future first. With my background in science and public health, you can be assured I will spend all day, every day, working to make sure we have the resources and systems in place so that everyone has the opportunity to thrive. I will work collaboratively with our community organizations, board of supervisors, contractors, and the public to fund things that truly work for the people who call Dane County home. I invite you to learn more and join my campaign at reginafordane.com and work together with me for a sustainable, equitable, and vibrant future for Dane County. I ask for your vote on August 13th. Thank you, Wes Sparkman. Once again, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting tonight's forum. You've heard many thoughtful responses to your questions tonight. As an experienced Dane County public servant, with knowledge and personnel, public personnel administration, I'll consider the issues of childcare, housing, climate action, decimating the glass ceiling, listening to Dane County Union votes, and innovation and employment benefits. I have a few areas in common with other candidates, but I, it is my varied experience creating public private partnerships and building bridges that will help us build a better Dane County today. At the August 13th election primary, vote West for experience, fiscal prudence, and social responsibility.
Thank you very much. We are out of time. Thank you, Dana Pelabon, Melissa Agard, Regina Vitiver, and Wes Sparkman for sharing your time, your vision for the county, and your experience with us. Thank you to the um, volunteers who made this run uh, so smoothly. Thank you for writing legibly. Those of you who wrote on note cards, that was a that was a huge bonus. Thanks to the Sequoia Library for their generosity in hosting this event, and the League of Women Voters for Dane County and the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal at UW Mass. Yeah, and we're going to go like a minute or so over, but that's okay. We're not on the radio, so it's all right to do that. <laughs> the, um, I, I want to thank you most of all for coming and uh, for taking your uh, civic duty so seriously. This forum has helped uh, you make up your mind when it comes to voting for Dane County Executive. You will narrow the field of candidates from four to two on August 13th, and those two will advance to the November 5th ballot. The League of Women Voters of Dane County wants me to also mention that we are going to have a discussion about those two constitutional amendment questions that are on the August ballot tomorrow, July 30th at 6.30 p.m. right here, same room at the Sequoia Library. And I also wanted to remind you that in-person absentee voting or early voting starts tomorrow in Wisconsin. This will be one of the sites in Madison. You can check with your local clerk for times and locations. For Mike Wagner and the UW-Madison Center for Communication and Civic Renewal and the League of Women Voters of Dane County and the Madison Public Library, I'm Joy Cardine. Good night.